so let me just quickly uh, try to show you some experimental uh, observations of this and then we can uh, we can go from there so this is not a theoretical curiosity but actually you can observe okay so this is basically the graph you are seeing here is uh, fluorescence fluorescence from i think rubidium atoms so i have taken this from this book textbook on the bottom here mark fox so this is what we will refer to a lot of quantum optics uh, part okay so what this is showing you is if you observe uh, fluorescence now the x axis is what we call as pulse uh, pulse area so what it is is this electric fields right we want them to be large but in practice you are never it's never possible to get large electric fields with continuous waves so we have to use what are called as pulse lasers okay so typically what will happen is in a pulse laser your electric field i mean just for simplicity i'm just saying electric field goes up and down pulse like a pulse okay of course you're going to have this is a wave with terahertz frequency so there's a lot of oscillations but i'm simply talking about the magnitude of the electric field okay so basically now what happens is the pulse width becomes important okay so if i want to look at how much how much of uh, population that i'm creating you can immediately see that if you have this sort of a pulse depending on the pulse pulse width becomes very very important okay then so we will define a quantity which we will call as pulse area okay which is simply going to be mu 1 to which is a transition dipole moment by h bar and then i'll take an integral from minus infinity to infinity of electric field as a function of time dt okay so this is remember this is not the the electric field variation in the wave if you take that the average of it will be zero now what we are talking about the envelope okay so envelope is a, like a square pulse now if i integrate that i essentially get the area of the, under the pulse right so that is what is very important if you look at the area under the pulse what are the dimensions so we can quickly look, look at that dipole moment is charge times distance so coulomb's times distance h bar is joule second and my electric field is volts per meter times seconds right so immediately i'll see that the meters will cancel seconds will cancel charge times voltage is going to be joules so all of this will cancel so my pulse area is going to be time uh, dimensionless quantity okay so now if you look at this as you change the pulse width okay okay what you will see is as this varies from 0 to pi and 2 pi you will see some very interesting cases okay that is one of the first one you will see is if you look at this okay if my pulse width is such that i will call it a, you know what is the pulse area totally is pi okay so we call this as a pi pulse if you have a pi pulse that means the width is tuned in such a way that the overall width the area is basically pi okay when you do that initially your state had all of the initial system had all the atoms in the ground state but if you apply a pi pulse you have taken all the atoms into the excited state okay so let's say in this case atoms initially in let's say state 1 okay are promoted to or excited to state 2 when you have lot and that's it the pulse has stopped right so all the atoms are now in excited state i mean they are spontaneously emit by fluorescence okay implies a strong fluorescence due to spontaneous emission whereas if you increase a pulse width some more okay and let's say your pulse width now is 2 pi sorry i should not do this 2 pi pulse if i have this now my atoms initially are in state 1 are in 1 they are excited to state 2 and then also came back to ground state again okay so now initially it's to get excited to state 2 and then return to state 1 again 
so now eventually you at the end of the cycle at the end of the pulse what is the relative fraction of the atoms in the excited state none zero right so all the atoms let's say we have managed to pump it up to excited state and they have also come back down so you have one half cycle right of the oscillations if you look at this picture here in the past uh, let's say the probability right if i look at c2 now initially you started let's say you know uh, let's say uh, this is c2 right yeah initially you started out with zero you went up you came down that means there are no states no atoms in the excited state that means there's going to be weak fluorescence right implies weak fluorescence i'll simply say fl okay so that is why experimentally what you see is as you change the pulse width initially you'll see this strong fluorescence coming down to small fluorescence again as you further increase it's going okay and for this to happen one of the most important features is that if you want to observe such a thing your omega r right which is rabi frequency has to be large okay it might seem you know complicated but i just want you to take home this part that there is this rabi frequency which is dipole moment times the electric field by h bar and that should be much much larger than the whatever decay factors gamma decay rate okay so it turns out that this decay rate is basically you know it's uh, quite small if you have gases this is up to 10 power 7 to 10 power 8 per second so this is the rate typical rate for gases but you have a solid this is quite large 10 part 12 per second so very large decay rates so if you have a solid like for example gallium arsenide and if you show me rabi oscillations from gallium arsenide i mean it's 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 if i would say it's impossible okay but let's say if you have rubidium gas or something or sodium gas and things like that you can try to look at fluorescence from that and we'll see all right so uh I apply I apply a pulse I'll stop there and let's say I won't do anything else then initially my population is all in the excited state if I continue applying the pulse because of the coherent interactions eventually all of them will come down my pulse width is not the same when I have this you know excited or the ground states the pulse width is not the same you apply two different pulse widths generally apply more more population should be in the excited state okay from pi pulse if i go to 2 pi 2 pi i should think that okay no if the initial state was 100 i said 200 atoms should be in excited no because of the coherent interaction it actually comes down right think about it from the diffraction also let's say single slit diffraction you are shining light you diffract well, rather interference okay two beams two okay you will say that as it goes you should also see interference you know you should see bright light everywhere no but because of constructive additions and uh, uh, destructions you have dark and bright spots bright fringes appearing in interference similar thing you can say this is interference phenomena in the population densities there it was space an interference pattern is in space you are wearing bright and dark constructive and destructive interference here in time it is happening because the populations are changing so this is the coherent part whenever you see the word coherent it essentially means that you have this uh, uh, the phase factor is constant the phase difference are constant so in a sing, uh, double slit experiment we try to fix that by taking the same source plane wave front and then two different points so the phases will be con- the phase relation between them is constant if i put two different lamps exciting two different uh, you know sources i cannot get interference so i have to impose a fixed phase relationship so in a way i have to impose what uh, this is spatial coherence as well i have to impose then i can create this okay there in the interference here it is i should not have any temporal you know decoherence any 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 decay decay factor or decay rate will actually kill my this one okay so so these experiments are challenging actually i mean this was done back in the 70s and 80s i think but they are quite interesting experiments where you know people have gone down to the fundamental behaviors of the systems this is an amazing thing okay so one before i close i'll just tell you you know i'll just show you one more case so now what we saw was you have these populations which are oscillating in time so immediately i can i mean <laughs> use my basic fourier transform theory i understand that if i modulate a signal i get side bands okay so something was like this was predicted so uh, a guy by name molo 
I, I don't know his first name. So what he predicted was, in addition to the initial line, you should also have some side bands. So this okay, I should use right. These side bands due to Rabi oscillations. Okay, so and then the similar, you know, basically you can think of this as you know you are looking at it in frequency. So let's say you have you want to look at uh, you excite a system, and then you want to look at at the excitation wavelength. That's omega naught. You have the fluorescence, but then even if you detune a little bit away from it, you will start seeing this additional peaks, you know, fluorescence. So this is fluorescence signal, right? So basically, this uh, is a frequency domain representation. of Rabi oscillations of okay and the way you know this has been interpreted is let's say if you took uh, took a simple atom right we have talked about two level systems i somehow pump and you know, excite a two level system where will be my fluorescence it the transition wavelength right in this case you know this is basically transition energy right if i have a simple system transition frequency this is where your fluorescence should happen but now because of this large intensity we are seeing this coherence between the wave functions and now the fluorescence is not just at that particular frequency but now we we talk of what are known as dress states and dress state here dress state okay this essentially means this is a coupled atom photon state okay these cannot occur without the photon field you should have a photon state now because of the strong interaction between the atom and the photon it turns out that the each state gets split into two i mean this is the interpretation of uh, the rabi oscillations so essentially if your omega r is a rabi frequency so rabi frequency by 2 rabi frequency by 2 it the state splits into two here up and down this is Minus omega r, uh, omega, let's say omega r by two, and this is plus omega r by two. So the frequency splits, uh, the state splits into two from both excited and the ground states. So in effect, what you end up getting is, depending on the transitions, you will get a omega minus omega naught minus omega r and omega naught plus omega r. In addition to the the fundamental, rather the the transition frequency, right? The transition frequency, I can say it is this omega naught. So, because of that, you see that uh, these additional peaks occur in the frequency spectrum. In the previous case, time domain, but time domain. If you want to capture the fluorescence at that scale, it's I mean, it's uh, nanoseconds is easy, but it's yeah, it's not that overall that uh, uh, simple to do experiment. Frequency means you can a spectrometer, I can sweep it and I can see where the fluorescence occurs, and it will tell me that okay, there is a particular state there. Okay, and you might say, oh, why do I care about all this? well it turns out that if you are having the ability to put a state in you know put a system in a particular state let's say ground state or in the excited state that has applications in quantum optics okay you can essentially control the fluorescence just by using the uh, you are controlling the quantum state of the system so that is a very important application for uh, let's say in quantum optics and another application is basically in nmr nmr you basically look at uh, nuclear magnetic resonance right so you inject these atoms and then you look at a particular resonance frequency and then you see this uh, signature okay but if you have that also can be modeled as a two level system because you apply you you i forgot which species but you inject a particular species and you subject it to a magnetic field then the splitting occurs so the splitting essentially gives you a characteristic microwave signal that that can be monitored so you can map out the details of your let's say brain or something right or you can even map out different what sort of systems i mean if every each atom will have a different sort of a uh, characteristic emission and uh, that there also you have two level systems and actually you can control whether you want to put the system in the higher level or lower level states and so on so rabi oscillations are seen in that 
So any system where you have two-level system, I mean, I mean, you would say, I mean, we generally don't talk of it as Ravi oscillations, but capacitor and inductor also is like a system where you have oscillations happening. Okay. Okay. If it's completely getting lost, of course you're losing out. Okay. It might be interesting to see if you have. Anyway, yeah, we can, we can, yeah. So any other questions? Okay. The question was uh, this omega r, that's the Ravi frequency, is in the uh, frequency I said is about. I mean, uh, the time period is nanoseconds, I would say. So typically gigahertz or something. So the question is, uh, what is the time scale of this omega naught and omega r? So omega naught means the transition frequency, if you're looking at it optical regime, right? The frequency is hundreds of terahertz. The shift is gigahertz. So very small shift. So that's, I mean, that's another reason why you will not observe it in, let's say, solids easily. The line itself is broad. What will you observe there? In frequency domain, if you look at it, you are seeing this, the sidebands are appearing, right? If this entire, the base, central, central transition itself is broad, <laughs> Ravi oscillations are not, you know, good. so you need much, much stronger Ravi shifts. And before that, you will start burning your gallium arsenide sample. <laughs> yeah. Or something, any solid sample, yeah. Mm. Okay, so I, okay, so the damping rate is what matters. In solids, one of the reasons why the damping is very fast, we say 10 part, 12 per second, right? That is because of collisions. Right? Because of all this. So typically, even in atoms, you're going to have collisions. That causes damping. So typically, a lot of these measurements are done at low temperatures. So that you reduce the damping so that your omega is much, omega r is much later, greater than the damping. So, I mean, ideally, yeah, these measurements, I think, are done at low temperatures. All right? So, yeah. All right. Okay? All right. Uh, so, yeah, that was an introduction to how an atom can interact. So the main take home message I would say is that previously we thought of this two level system and then the population density is simply a function and some constant exponential decay function or something, right? It's not exactly that. That is okay when you are, you know, in the bulk case or, you know, you have a statistical mixture of different atoms. But if you have a very carefully excited states, which where the states have a fixed phase relation between the, you know, uh, let's say low, lower and the upper state, then you have oscillations in the population that can actually result in experimentally observable effects. So a lot of li recent literature, if you look at it, you'll see these terms, Rabi oscillations, we have seen that this. So it's very important, very interesting effect that's been around for some time. And I think increasingly nanophotonics people are interested. We'll also look at some of these things in uh, plasmonic systems in the next lecture. Anyway, so yeah, with that, I would like to stop here and then we'll continue in the next class. All right. So, any other questions? No? Thank you so much.